Energy Economics and I are making a presentation today entitled uh, Agricultural Evolution in the Sense of Place in Eastern Kentucky. Um, the way we're going to handle this is that uh, uh, I will uh, begin by reading from the draft of the paper that we prepared. Uh, that will be the dull part of the presentation. Uh, and following that, uh, Phil will uh, print to you some results of a, uh, a survey of some 200 farms uh, that we made uh, a little over a year ago uh, here in, uh, uh, or during the past year, uh, here in uh, eastern Kentucky. Uh, the data on that is not entirely in that, uh, analyzed yet, but we think we're coming up with some end conclusions. Um, so, uh, to begin, uh, Appalachia, and more specifically Eastern Kentucky, are often identified with a distinctive subculture in the United States. And a prominent feature of this subculture, uh, a deep attachment to locality, has evoked both praise and blame. Romantics have stressed the quaint, homespun quality of Appalachian independence and isolationism, while critics have charged that the narrow horizons are a self-imposed obel to better. The most caustic critics have uh, suggested that Appalachia is a refuge subculture, an insular cocoon, which excuses not only failed effort, but also the failure to even make an effort. Um, the purpose of our presentation today is not to side with uh, either of these uh, perspectives. We suspect there's more than a grain of truth in both. Uh, and instead, we want to be concerned with discussing an underlying cause of the Appalachian scent place, a factor which uh, has not been significantly acknowledged. Um, at the outset, we say that there are a variety of factors which uh, might be said to contribute to a, a social consciousness, which we're calling the Appalachian sense of place. It is a central tenet of social analysis to recognize that beliefs and feelings are not intrinsic to the individual experience, but rather are the products of social interactions and communication. Therefore, as first approximation, we would propose that the sense of place is a product of peculiarities of that Appalachian society and social experience. Now, some analysts would stop here and begin examining the closed nature of Appalachian communities, str stressing the significance of family and neighborly uh, ties, the distrust with which uh, strangers are sometimes perceived, and conclude that herein lies the explanation for the preference of isolationism. Our concern in this presentation is not with the nature of the Appalachian community per se, however, although we quite agree with authors who stress its significance. Instead, we wish to focus on material and economic conditions that may be said to underline to create the infrastructure for a strong sense of local community. In particular, we wish to examine the material and economic conditions entailed in the practice of agriculture in Appalachia. Our evidence will be historical as well as contemporary, since a pattern of thought is ingrained as the sense of place not have developed recently, but is a response to general conditions which have prevailed over and over generations. Uh, our evidence is also drawn from eastern Kentucky, but the conclusions may be extrapolated to other parts of the southern Appalachian region. Our, uh, Ours is a perspective which states that social consciousness is ultimately shaped by the influence of material conditions, an approach which has been termed cultural materialism. It reasons that over time, the material conditions of human existence select the modes of social consciousness indirectly through the shaping of the organization of human communities and the structuring of the na nature of social intercourse. In sum, our argument will be to suggest uh, how agriculture has influenced social interactions and communications so as to produce the sense of place mentality characteristic of uh, people in eastern Kentucky and elsewhere in Appalachia. To introduce this theme, it will be well to consider how others have attributed specific causes to the sense of place. Sense of place. Uh, geography has always figured importantly in scholars' efforts to understand the unique culture of Appalachia. 
A thoroughgoing attempt to attribute isolationism to the unusually harsh and limiting conditions of the mountain environment is found in the work of an early geographer, Ellen Churchill Semple, who published in 1901. Uh, and uh, she states in, her, in this classic study that the ruggedness of the terrain has kept the population isolated from modern changes, allowing old traditions to continue unabated. Virtually to the present day, the region has posed serious obstacles to transportation and communications because of its rugged uh, mountains and narrowing valleys. Sediment, settlement patterns have generally conformed to the major rivers or tributaries, uh, which push ever far, farther into the mountain fastnesses and then end in cul-de-sacs so that you get a, a, a situation where the farther you get in, uh, 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 information uh, has, uh, has to travel a longer uh, uh, and more winding path. Um, now, today we've got interstate highways, of course, penetrating regions, a, a good system of uh, roads, uh, and contact with the outside world uh, is uh, fairly easy uh, for the first time. But this is really a, de a development of only the last few decades. Another fact that's often mentioned as having created the context for Appalachian isolationism is the financial domination of the region by external capital and extractive industry, uh, first logging and later coal mining. Logging operations began in the latter half of the 19th century, but the far greater pack was undoubtedly due to coal, which got underway uh, uh, early in the present century. These extractive industries, in one respect, created a more cosmopolitan appearing society in Appalachia because in order to have sufficient labor, immigrants from Eastern Europe and some Southern blacks were drawn into the region to supplement the primarily Scotch, Irish, and German populations of earlier settlement. But the social structure of the logging coal camps were anything but cosmopolitan. Immigrants were brought in largely to increase the supply of labor and to forestall unionization. Ethnic groups were encouraged to remain among their own kind, and prejudices between the different groups played into the hands of the logging and mining companies. Beyond this, of course, companies created their own towns and fostered dependency inhabitants on the company store, which supplied many of the necessities of life. Uh, this paternalism of the companies was another convenient arrangement for management, uh, helped to keep unionism at bay until the uh, early decades of the present century. After the after railroads and conveniences began to appear, a new form of patronage developed in county government, and as tax revenues and assistance from state government were slowly increased, the county school system became a major employer and uh, local patronage work barrel as we have seen uh, in the Herald Leader recently. Uh, to be preferred for employment by the county, and more particularly in schools and whatever capacity, uh, required that one know the right people, or that preferably one be from a, a, a member of a family which uh, controlled these local jobs. Another government pork barrel was established with the federal anti-poverty programs of the Depression and subsequently du during Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. While the importance of these frequently mentioned factors for isolationism in eastern Kentucky cannot be overstressed, they do not tell the whole story. Another key influence is what we are calling agricultural involution, a term borrowed from Clifford Geertz's study of economic and cultural stagnation in, in um, Java. In contemplating the history, economy, and culture of Java, Geertz found an, a process of degenerative cultural change uh, where established patterns of agricultural production were simply repeated in an effort to multiply niches for an increasing population. The result was economic stagnation and an inability for transformation or improvement. While the parallel is doubtlessly a rough one, it nevertheless seems to us that an, an analogous process has taken place in Appalachia. Moreover, we suspect that agricultural involution as a cause is at least as significant as extractive industries, patronage politics, and welfare programs in shaping the region's culture. We will consider this by focusing on historical and contemporary farming systems in eastern Kentucky. 
Now, for the picture on historical farming systems. The farming system established by the original white settlers in eastern Kentucky lasted with only minor changes or development until the first decades of the present century. To understand its character, we must uh, consider how the region was settled. The main thrust of settlement occurred by 1850. The majority of the pioneers who moved westward from the eastern seaboard traveled by either of two routes. They came through Pittsburgh and then continued by canoe and river boat into Kentucky, while others uh, took a southern route overland through the Cumberland Gap. The main flow of these migrants uh, continued westward to settle the rolling lands of central Kentucky and uh, parts of Tennessee. Only a minority circled back into the mountains of eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. Settlement in this region followed the course of the large rivers, branching up the narrow tributaries and finally working into the narrow hollows and coves formed by the still smaller tributaries. This migration dried up about 1850, and for the next century, mountain society was largely cut off from the rest of the world. Survival was made possible through homesteading and subsistence agriculture. The thin and fertile soils of the region and the steep topography created the conditions for the isolation of families in hollows where a meager existence could be scratched from the thin mountain soil. Soil exhaustion and erosion combined with natural population increase to force homesteaders with unproductive farms and surplus children to go deeper and deeper into the mountains, wedging their way into ever narrower and remote hollows planting their crops and building their log cabins ever farther up on the sides of the steep slopes. Thus, a process that we have chosen to call agricultural involution, a turning inward with total dependence upon inadequate local resources which were utilized by methods incapable of change but only of endless repetition. This type of pioneering farming continued in eastern Kentucky until the uh, beginnings of the present century, as Semple's monograph uh, uh, shows. The following description that I'm going to give you of the prevailing farming system is taken from uh, uh, Semple's work on the region. The farms of the region tended to be large by comparison with those in central Kentucky at the same time period, frequently numbering several hundred acres. The more mountainous and infertile land, the larger the farm was likely to be. Less than 30% of the acreage was improved, the balance was in forest to rough pasture. Land clearing for cultivation followed the Indian practice of girdling trees, and crops were placed, uh, were planted between skeletons of the dead forest giants, the big uh, trees with, which uh, uh, had died and lost their leaves. The chief crop, Indian corn, was the main food of both man and beast. In the narrow hollows and coves, cornfields covered the slopes even to the ridge line. Runoff erosion was so severe that the yield per acre was estimated to be only one third that uh, in the bluegrass of central Kentucky. Even farmers who plowed on the contours could not expect to get more than two or three successive crops off the same field before it had to be rested. The labor applied to farming was limited to, to what man and his family could muster. Young men were encouraged to marry uh, uh, early and establish independent families so that their labor was soon lost to their natal family. A uh, casual and casual labor for hire was almost non-existent. A fledgling uh, lumber industry absorbed this type of worker. Agricultural influence were few and simple. The primitive bull tongue plow was designed to scratch the thin soil and easily between the numerous rocks and roots. Besides corn, oats were the only field crop of any consequence, and their yield was also very poor. Every family had a vegetable garden, which was always located beside the cabin, and lavish attention was given to it, especially by the women. It was plowed in the spring by the man of the household and fertilized by manure. This was the only part of the farm to receive fertilizer. Any subsequent plowing and all weeding was done by women. The average garden contained potatoes, beets, uh, cabbage, onions, pumpkins, and dwarf tomatoes. Adjoining the garden, there was likely to be a small patch of tobacco grown for household use. 
since tobacco was uh, smoked uh, in clay or corn cob pipes or taken a snuff by both sexes and by young and old uh, alike. In addition, corn and garden vegetables, livestock, were a, an essential product of this self-subsisting uh, farm. A horse could pull the plow if needed and provided the mount for traveling long distances. Steers, however, were more usually kept for plowing and hauling logs. The milk cow was a necessity for every household, but processed dairy products such as cheese were in common in the predominantly Anglo-Saxon area of eastern Kentucky. Razorback pigs, pigs which subsisted largely on the mast of the forest, were popular everywhere. Sheep were raised on some farms which had ample pasture, and these were really the only uh, product of the mountain farm which could be uh, easily trekked to outside markets. Activities which became specialized trades in more densely populated areas, cobbler, blacksmith, miller, and the like, tended to remain household chores in the remote mountains. And home manufacturing of such items as moccasins and blankets for family use and chewing one's own horse uh, reduced the reliance upon cash. Thus, most of the necessities were produced by the uh, immediate family. Some cash was required, nevertheless, for tools and cloth, and this was acquired by selling timber uh, off the farm by occasional wage labor and by collecting and selling mountain herbs, and of course also by moonshining. Converting surplus corn into illegal corn his whiskey was probably the principal source of cash for a large number of households, especially those where a woman was household head. The practice instilled a region-wide distrust of government officials. Um, Credit, too, was usually non-existent and was largely unneeded for this type of pioneer farming. Moreover, barter replaced cash in the mountain economy, and hunting game and gathering wild, food, uh, wild plant foods were used to supplement shortfalls in farm production. The consequences of this farming system for the formation of closed local communities cannot be overestimated. A rural-urban distinction hardly existed in Appalachian societies. Towns and cities were found only in a few strategic locations and their influence was carried into the rest of the region by itinerant traders, preachers, and the like who traveled on horseback. Local communities such as they were consisted of homesteads nestled in a cove or hollow. Typically, the families occupying a hollow were closely related by ship and intermarriage, while relations with families in the neighboring valley were often characterized by mistrust, if not hostility. This was not a consequence of geography or geographic isolation alone. It was, in a very real sense, uh, we think, the product of a low productivity farming system which quickly exhausted soil resources and created pressures on the uh, arable land available. A fierce loyalty to locality, Appalachian sense of place, evolved, at least in part, from a sort of zero-sum zero play for limited arable land. The opening of the region, which the railroad improved uh, highways caused, led to a major transformation in the system of agriculture. County seats became centers for farming inputs as well as farm products. Uh, tobacco rose to preeminence as a cash crop. The contemporary farming system reflects these changes, but it, like the one preceding it, uh, has, been has been a pattern that has remained fixed over several generations. It, too, has relied to a large degree on local resources, has been labor-intensive, and has not been able to greatly transform itself. The government's tobacco program has been little more than a welfare subsidy to the uh, rural poor of the region, and the major new wrinkle in the present system, part-time farming, has heightened localism by supplementing the often low and uncertain wages of non-agricultural jobs in mining and light manufacturing. Okay, let's take a brief look at the contemporary farming system. Making generalizations about agriculture in contemporary Appalachia is difficult because of the considerable diversity of enterprises in the region. For example, there are uh, many specialized farming ventures in poultry, dairy, orchards, ornamental plants, vegetables, and so forth. 
Nevertheless, there are certain carryovers from the past which render ag agriculture involuted in the present circumstances. There are also new aspects of the farming system which have helped to sustain the process of agricultural involution. Planting field crops on steep slopes, harvesting timber, and keeping a home garden are still ubiquitous in eastern Kentucky. These practices betoken the continued importance of low-yield, homesteading-type agriculture, in spite of the steady growth of marketing opportunities for farmers. Generally speaking, only the larger producers in the region have been able to really take advantage of markets. Smaller producers have relied on them fitfully as a source of cash. Aside specialized operations such as dairying or orchards, which have been successful largely because their numbers have been generally uh, low so as not to exceed regional demand, the only important agricultural markets in the region as a whole are those tobacco and beef cattle. Beef cattle production has not offered a path out of the involution trap in which farming enterprise reinforced extreme, extreme localism. Even more than the case of tobacco, cattle markets have been extremely localized. Low demand has offered producers spot revenues with little opportunity for capital accumulation or technological modernization. The table um, that has been supplied to you points out some characteristics of the region which indicate its involuted character. And although the percentage of the population in the Appalachian counties um, which is involved in farming is two-thirds greater than the percentage for the state as a whole, the average farm income in 1985 in the Appalachian counties was less than one-half the income statewide. The percentage of part-time farmers is another indication of economic marginality as well as being a sign of the need to boost incomes by diversifying is also higher in eastern Kentucky than the state as a whole. And view it's not surprising that the average farm size and even more importantly the average crop acreage in eastern Kentucky also fall considerably below its averages. The modern uh, Appalachian sense of place is therefore a legacy from the rural past. Uh, there is continuity of culture and style of consciousness in parochial communities when there is a strong incentive to possess land in order to produce products mm -hmm. largely for home consumption. Tobacco aside, eastern Kentucky farmers are little engaged in commercial enterprise and the contemporary farming system is closer to the pioneering homestead past than it is to the commercial farming systems that predominate in central and western Kentucky. Um, I have written, we have a conclusion at this point, but it, it uh, would be more appropriate now if uh, Phil were to uh, uh, come up here behind the podium and uh, present you some of the uh, conclusions from our uh, recent survey and which I believe will amplify uh, considerably on the general statements I've made here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Kinkle. When this uh, survey we'll be discussing we took place within about the past year, uh, I guess as I started the survey, I was an uh, agribusiness specialist here at Moorhead State University and I'm now with the Department of Agricultural Economics at University of Kentucky. Uh, what I'd like you to do is describe a little bit uh, the purposes of our survey and share with you some of the results and then uh, bring it into some of the conclusions that uh, are consistent and are not consistent with this concept of uh, involution or sense of place uh, in agriculture in eastern Kentucky and uh, also share maybe some overall conclusions which we can draw from this survey. Um, <coughs> The purpose, the purpose of the survey was to examine the current farming practices of eastern Kentucky to investigate the existence of one or more uh, homogeneous systems of farming. Uh, in other words, we were trying to break across county lines and see if there's not uh, several, one or more farming systems in the region which maybe could be identified as a group by themselves and possible uh, uh, policy implications. and. Uh, uh, if you wish to affect the region, um, can we identify certain categories of producers to work with? And a uh, second objective was to identify these, uh, all the farming systems in the region with a particular sense of looking at the input 
output sources of labor, sources of capital, uh, and see how that seems to be close. Uh, we selected five counties on a random basis to serve as a representation of Northeast Kentucky. We looked at uh, Bath, Carter, Elliott, Menifee, and Owsley counties. Uh, the overall population uh, of farms that uh, served as our sampling base was farms identified as farm operations by the USDA census, which basically includes any farm operation with more than $1,000 of gross uh, receipts, either crop or livestock. Uh, the interviews were, we uh, conducted in-depth interviews of 40 farms uh, in each of the five counties, and the uh, interviews were co collected by one or more individuals in each county, and all the interviewers either res resided in or very near the county under study. Um, some summary of the uh, preliminary results, uh, first on an overall basis, uh, <clears throat> we found an average size of farm of 134 acres, which is fairly consistent with 119 acres in the region, and on um, tillable acres we found around 56 tillable acres. Uh, as opposed to 17 acres in crops shown region, which uh, when you consider rotational constraints, it's probably also uh, indicating that we have a fairly good representative sample. Uh, for the survey as a whole, our operators averaged about 54 years old uh, and worked off the farm 36 hours per week. Uh, average tackle allotment was about 3,500 pounds, which uh, with about 3,800 pounds um, also leased. Uh, we averaged about uh, 17 acres of corn per farm, uh, around 10 acres of silage, uh, around 11 acres of alfalfa. Interestingly enough, in the region as a whole, out of the uh, 11 or 12 acres of alfalfa grown, only 8% of that alfalfa was sold. Uh, so what we, as we put the survey together, thought might be an important cash crop, uh, looks like maybe it's more related to a uh, uh, higher quality feed stuff for a livestock enterprise or maybe more inducive of a uh, more intensely managed livestock operation and also uh, may indicate the potential for some marketing opportunities in the area. Uh, vegetable acres was around half an acre per farm. Uh, out of the whole region we had 11 people, 11 of the 200, uh, around 5 percent were producing vegetables on a commercial basis. Uh, soybean acres, uh, again with six producers, is about 10 acres. Uh, not extremely significant. Uh, beef cattle, uh, we, we're looking at about 23 head of beef cattle per farm, uh, about 14 uh, additional feeder steers, and about 10 additional heifers. Uh, pastured on a total of 75 acres per farm. And uh, about 60% of the hay and forage and 40% of the uh, corn and concentrates were produced on the farm. Uh, so we have a very significant amount of on-farm uh, farm inputs into beef cattle. Uh, dairy cattle, we only had uh, 13 producers indicating, which was about 16 per farm. Uh, we'll break that down to counties, but uh, we had uh, maybe more than we expected a very small dairy or family cow type operations. Uh, hogs, again, we had about five uh, sows per farm. Uh, that really will be anticipated. Uh, and uh, sheep, uh, we had three producers with sheep, averaging about 21 uh, used per flock. Uh, and uh, hens were indicating 31 people with poultry operations, and uh, with the exception of one large operation, these are in the 10 to 40 bird range. So again, a uh, home type consumption operation. Uh, and uh, as a whole, we're looking at about 75 acres of timber on the farm. About a quarter of that is harvested at any time for sale and uh, evenly divided between harvested less, off, less frequently than every five years and more frequently than five years. About 40% of that is logged by, that, that is harvested is logged by the farm operator. Uh, around 22% of the farmers had mortgages and 12% uh, had machinery credit and 17% had seasonal and uh, a little less than half a percent were indicating some very significant farm activity that we didn't include in our survey. Uh, so that's our estimation of the, uh, the region as a whole. Uh, what I'd like to do briefly is kind of show how that breaks down by county, uh, and I guess maybe the underlying uh, 
uh, theme is that we don't, uh, we have a lot of diversity both within counties and between counties. Uh, the tillable acres, of course, Beth County, kind of on the edge of the bluegrass, uh, had many more tillable acres, 111 versus our average of about 56, and uh, all the way down to Carter County, of uh, average of about 24 acres of farm. Um, the uh, age and off-farm hours was uh, pretty consistent through counties. Uh, not, a lot, not an awful lot of difference. Uh, Owsley County uh, showing by far the lowest amount of off-farm acres. Uh, tobacco allotment, uh, again, very somewhat beneath between the counties from a high of about 5,000 in uh, Bath County down to a low of about 2,000 in Carter County. Uh, corn acres, kind of the same pattern, about 31 acres uh, averages in uh, Bath County, uh, then a three, three acres average in Elliott County. Uh, and somewhat the same pattern uh, all the way through our data there. Uh, alfalfa, uh, Seems like we see an exceptionally high amount of alfalfa, 31 acres per farm in Owsley County of the farms we surveyed, down to uh, a low of six in Bath County, uh, I guess lower than that, three in Manatee County. Um, and so overall, while we see uh, diversity, diversity between the counties, we don't see any clear patterns. In other words, we cannot simply pick out a good agricultural county or a poor agricultural county even a, a large-scale county or another uh, uh, smaller-scale county. And with that in mind, and uh, I guess partially a uh, purpose of the research, I tried to look at uh, is there some other ways, other ways to categorize these farms, which uh, may be better for policy implications, may give us a little uh, better idea of the farming going on out there. Um, if we try by tillable acres, and divide these up into uh, uh, the smallest 25 percent, the uh, uh, 25 to 50 percent, 50 to 75 percent, and the top quarter of the farming operations. Uh, we see here we have a the, the distribution is uh, very unevenly skewed. We have 25 percent of the farms have less than three acres of tillable, less, report less than three tillable acres. Uh, we have 25% um, are averaging around 12 of acres, 25% are averaging around 45 to acres, and we have 20% averaging around 162 to acres. So we seem to have uh, the very small, uh, kind of two categories, a very small and then a uh, mid-sized category, and then the large, about 162. And um, to acres seem to be a, uh, uh, it was not correlated particularly with uh, labor availability on the farm. Uh, with the uh, small farms had on the average about a person and a half of extra family member available for work on the farm, and it was pretty well consistent throughout. However, the tillable acres uh, didn't be highly correlated with uh, tobacco production. Uh, the smaller farms producing around 1,700 and the average amount of tobacco leased around 1,400 all the way up from about 6,200 uh, pounds on the uh, farms with larger tillable acres and uh, 4,200 leased. And uh, corn and uh, corn silage, uh, pretty much the same uh, story. We see a, a strong correlation there if we're trying to identify farms which have a uh, uh, larger scale and, and greater number of activities on the farm. Tillable acres seems to do a good job of predicting it. We did notice that uh, as far as grain equipment, we see a very uh, bimodal distribution. Uh, we seem to see a lot of farmers renting equipment, additional equipment for their farming activities that are in the middle range. Very few of the small farmers rent equipment and very few of the large, uh, larger scale farmers, but in the, uh, the whole 50%, uh, kind of in the middle of the distribution, seems to be where uh, most of the equipment rental was taking place. Uh, again, alfalfa production, uh, pretty much the same distribution uh, as the uh, went up very directly with uh, tillable acres. Uh, vegetable production uh, really didn't vary much with tillable acres. So getting back a little bit to our involution theme, it seemed like that uh, this was an un a underlying farm enterprise and it didn't really seem to have an awful lot to do with scale of the farm. Uh, 
And beef cattle, pretty much the same story. Uh, maybe a, a slight increase in the beef cattle on the farm and still the labors go up, but uh, still kind of an underlying size of beef cattle herd, which didn't seem to be uh, dependent on an awful lot of other scales of farming uh, on the farm. Uh, and uh, hogs, again, we're seeing the kind of a baseline of uh, hog production of around three to five per farm, and it didn't uh, seem to be correlated uh, as we led the farms up on the basis of tillable acres. And um, timber production, uh, certainly no clear trend there. We did see a uh, uh, fairly strong correlation between credit activity and tillable acres. Uh, with the larger scales, scaling farm involving more credit, well, more each seasonal and machinery credit. Um, so Tillable Acres seemed to do uh, an awful lot better job of dividing up the farms throughout the region than we did by uh, looking on county boundaries or geographic boundaries. Uh, we did the similar type thing with age to see uh, to what extent can we look at age of farmers and uh, see does that identify what type of farming is liable to be taking place and uh, can we expect that younger farmers uh, which will become uh, uh, obviously the uh, the mainstay farming in the future, are they farming any different ways than the older generations? Uh, we saw, of course, a uh, inverse relationship with off-farm hours. As the farms farmers got older, their, uh, the average number of time worked off the farm decreased from about 41 hours off the farm per week for the youngest group to about 14 hours average for the oldest group. I think that was 25 percent. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, not an awful lot of correlation uh, uh, between uh, tobacco production. Uh, we seem to be, seems actually to be highest in the very youngest farmers, and then uh, drop down in the second 25 percent, and then increase again in the uh, third in percent. And uh, uh, also, very interesting from the data, uh, the age of the farmers seemed to be actually somewhat inverse related to the amount of labor that was hired for the various tobacco activities. Uh, you know, one theory you'd certainly expect is that as the farmer got older, uh, labor would be a very big constraint and you'd see a lot more hired labor activities. For the, and uh, but we didn't seem to see that. It seemed that uh, the older farmers tended maybe to cut back on activities, but to even, uh, if anything, hire labor for the activities that they did take place. Uh, and whether that's uh, apple constraint or uh, uh, some other factors uh, that, that's uh, certainly something we saw strongly in the data. Um, corn production, we saw maybe a little bit of an inverse relationship, but not an awful lot. Uh, pretty much the same way with silage uh, production and uh, alfalfa production. No real clear trend. Uh, it's the age of farmer uh, that would uh, give us an indication of the expected scale of operation. Uh, uh, vegetable production is one of the one areas where we did see a uh, inverse relationship. We saw the younger farmers uh, were more likely to be producing vegetables uh, commercially and producing a larger number of uh, acreage of vegetables for home consumption. Uh, I guess you would, would postulate that that's uh, because it's such a labor-intensive crop. Uh, beef cattle, again, fairly well uh, distributed uh, throughout the age group. There's no, uh, doesn't seem any indication that different age farmers are, uh, have small or larger herds or are managing the beef cattle in significantly different ways. Um, and uh, again, tying into our involution concept, uh, the uh, hogs that were produced, you know, again, about five, uh, averaging about five per farm. Uh, with no real clear trend that uh, sorting by age uh, would uh, give us much difference there. Uh, and a, a similar trend in, ch in chickens. Um, we do have a, a very strong inverse relationship between the mortgage and, uh, and all types of credit with age that the older farmers, uh, I guess as would be expected, are uh, have lower amounts of uh, mortgage on the farm or are less likely to have a mortgage and are less likely to use uh, both machinery and seasonal credit. Um, with that in mind, uh, we also looked at the data from the uh, standpoint of how much additional labor was available on the farm. And 
uh, see, seems to be that the labor availability is uh, dictating what type of farming systems take place. Uh, and, uh, and again, dividing the data uh, up into quarters uh, on the basis of adult labor availability. And uh, we found that basically uh, availability in the farm was a pretty uncorrelated or pretty poor predictor of the type of farming activities going on. Uh, had almost no correlation with um, uh, till acres, had very little correlation with hours worked off the farm, um, not much correlation with tobacco. In fact, we have almost identical uh, amounts of tobacco produced and tobacco leased, uh, regardless of the labor available on the farm. None hired adult labor for their farming operation. Um, and uh, again, pretty consistent with our uh, sense of place concept. Uh, our hog production and our uh, uh, chicken production, again, pretty well uh, unrelated to the amount of labor activity available on the farm. Farmers seem to be pretty well equally likely uh, to undertake those activities. Uh, and uh, again, uh, harvesting timber for sale, uh, we're seeing about 20 to 25 percent of the farmers with timber in uh, with no matter what their available labor were likely to harvest it for sale, but we did see a strong relationship that farmers with more available labor were more likely to log the timber themselves. Uh, so that may be a non-traditional uh, farming operation going on that uh, does seem to be dependent upon the, the household and the, the, the labor available to the farm. And uh, also, interestingly enough, in uh, all of the credit categories, uh, the uh, use of a farm mortgage, uh, machinery credit, and seasonal credit, farmers with uh, a more amount of farm labor available to them are much more likely to be using uh, sources of credit. Uh, whether this relates to a uh, judgment by the lender that they're more able to carry on the farming operation, or whether this is uh, because since they uh, have more available labor that they then come up with a capital constraint as far as undertaking these activities. But for whatever case, uh, we found that uh, uh, farm labor was a, a very good method of predicting how farm credit would go on. Um, and running too quick here, we also looked toward them by the farmers that did use seasonal credit and see uh, if that what type of a predictor that was. And once again, we saw that that was a pretty strong predictor of the scale and amount of farming activities taken on. Um, I guess I ought to mention in all these other categories that we've gone over, we also looked at how these things are distributed throughout the counties, and we basically found no relationship. Uh, we didn't find that the counties were consistent in all uh, areas. In other words, uh, the counties didn't consistently have the same number of small farms, large farms, but also we didn't find the counties consistently fall into uh, the same categories. Uh, the, uh, when we look at the number of uh, farmers in an age group, uh, we saw different counties high on that than when we did with total acres and saw really no pattern. Uh, so which kind of leads to believe that the uh, county is a, a pretty poor way to categorize farming debt. Uh, but seasonal credit, we did see a strong correlation between um, the amount of seasonal credit used and the total acres under production. Uh, we saw an inverse relationship with off labor, so that uh, as uh, farmers that were working more hours off the farm were much less likely to use seasonal credit. Um, and again, uh, to tobacco production, uh, seasonal credit seemed to be a very good way to predict that. Farmers that were using a lot more seasonal credit uh, that were growing a lot more tobacco or maybe vice versa, the uh, farmers that had larger tobacco under production were much more likely to use seasonal credit, but uh, a strong correlation there. And pretty much the same pattern throughout. Uh, corn acres, corn silage acres, uh, if we wanted to get an indication of uh, the scale of these operations, the seasonal credit seemed to be a, a uh, strong method of looking at that. Uh, and again, slightly our, uh, uh, maybe our concept of involution, but the uh, vegetable production did not seem to be very correlated uh, with the amount of seasonal credit under, underway. Uh, neither did the beef cattle, the uh, hogs produced, the hens produced, and maybe uh, most interesting in the credit area, uh, when we looked at the mortgages, uh, number of mortgages on farms as compared to the seasonal credit, we didn't really see any correlation at all. Uh, we often tend to categorize farms with high debt ratios, low debt ratios, 
and yet at least this study would indicate that uh, farms that have high debt ratios as far as a mortgage are uh, no more likely to have seasonal credit and vice versa. So maybe we need to be looking at the types of credit and maybe the uh, impact on credit on the farming operation uh, depends on whether it's credit for a, a short-term purpose or mortgage. Uh, there seems to be a lot uh, more going on there than maybe we would have first expected. Uh, So, from all that, uh, let me try to sum it up into a few of uh, what we can say some conclusions on that. First, as far as our farming systems and evolution idea, uh, we did seem like that hogs, beef cattle, hens, tobacco, and vegetables seem to be pretty underlined in the region and pretty uncorrelated uh, to any other predictor or anything else we can find on our farms and our studies. Uh, we also found uh, strong policy implication that the uh, county dividing things up in uh, county data, which is obviously the way uh, the data is usually predicted, usually presented, uh, did a very poor job of representing the farming going on. That we saw a lot of different systems within a county, and we see a lot more similarity between different uh, farming systems between counties than we did taking the county as a whole. And uh, the other, also, uh, we found that the other way you see farming operations is by total acres on the farm. And we found that also did a very poor job, that uh, tillable acres and all activities going on are pretty uncorrelated with the total size of farm. And so maybe if we want to look at a, uh, the farming operations going on, tillable acres and not total acres would be the key to, uh, to center in on. Um, we found that uh, looking at age of farmers, that it was correlated with the size of farm. The older farmers tended to have uh, larger farms whether that was because they bought more land as their finances allowed or whether because younger farmers maybe didn't inherit a farm, split it up, uh, we could just postulate. But we did see older farmers having uh, larger farms and uh, we did see that that was somewhat uh, inversely related with off-farm income, that older farmers were off the farm uh, less. And the older farmers were some less inclined to hire labor than the younger counterparts and they were also a little less likely to get into the vegetables and uh, other specialty enterprises. Uh, machinery rental, we noted that that was high in the very middle sizes of farm operation. Uh, might have implications if we're proposing uh, new farm systems which require machinery. That certainly wants to center in on the people that are currently uh, renting rather than uh, buying machinery. And available labor, we found, is basically uncorrelated with uh, most of the farming systems although we did see some correlation with the vegetable and initially enough beef cattle and log enterprises. And we also found that seasonal credit use is a very good predictor of the farming activities and that that was uh, not at all correlated with mortgages, but it was uh, somewhat correlated with, uh, inversely correlated with off-farm income. And uh, again, uh, we found that mortgage as a whole was basically not a good predictor of the farming operations going on. It seems to be somewhat drawn by other causes. That about sums up my work on the surveys. Do we have any questions? Or? And I'm very honored to be able to have this privilege. It was given to me by a gentleman in the back who felt that he could not squeeze through this space up here. And uh, your next speaker, for better or worse, is yours truly, Doug Adams. So I'm here, and uh, you still have a couple minutes you can get out if you like. But uh, my topic, and incidentally, I planned on really coming in and doing a, a demonstration and painting at the same time and, and talking with you while I've worked. But since I only have about 20 minutes, it didn't even uh, fair to take all the time necessary to set up my equipment and then uh, have to break it down and interfere with the next program, which is the uh, program about the country cemetery coming up in just a few minutes. So as the speaker was simply putting uh, his talking order upstairs, he was talking about the country store, which is a, a, a delightful program. And he was talking about how the country store owner really helped people from the cradle to the grave. Well, this is kind of what we're going to do here. We're going to start off from the cradle, and the cemetery program will be coming up in 30 minutes from now, or 20 minutes. So literally, if 
from the cradle to the grave apply here as well. <clears throat> the painting that I have up here is a painting of my grandfather's house that I have many fond memories of. And I guess the whole theme of the conference is sense of place in Appalachia. You sometimes in thinking back, for instance, regressing in thought and doing this kind of thing, which is quite different from the approach that I normally take in many of my paintings. So many things that you thought you had forgotten become very <clears throat> real to you again. Sounds and smells, things that brought smiles when you were a child. I can remember my grandmother's gingerbread, how good it smelled when she was baking it. I can remember being there and hearing her grinding coffee in the morning, getting breakfast. And the times that we would make molasses, sorghum in the fall, killing of hogs, and etc. When I grew up in rural eastern Kentucky, this took us in Whitesburg, Kentucky, or near Whitesburg, Kentucky, and as a boy growing up there, which is quite different today, but the land meant so much to us because we depended on it for everything. I mean, we did, we used very little from outside, which means we raised our own food. Uh, we bought cloth, but my mother would sell clothes. She would make a lot of the clothes and so forth. And the land was so important, and today it's not that important because things that we took so seriously that meant so much to us are just taken for granted today. When we talk about the landscape, <clears throat> most of us conjure up an image of trees and sky and snow and fields, etc. The landscape is everything that we have put together as a society. It's all that we have built, regardless of what that is. The McDonald's hamburger place is just as much a part of that as a rustic old house that we find some sentimental value to or some sentimental interest in. So we look at why we do things and we think about them. That <clears throat> we're creatures really of our past. We're creatures of environment. And people ask me, why do you find old houses interesting? Old houses are much like people. When I look at an old house, I see many, many things. I ask many, many questions. I think of the people who have lived there, the happy times, the sad times, the times that were hard, the times that were easy. <clears throat> so a house is really a kind of portrait within itself. Whereas your modern glass and steel structures today really tell you nothing. It's almost like looking at a little rosy-cheeked fat baby. They tell you nothing. They have no character. It takes a person who has got some years under their belt to develop the lines and the wrinkles, the sunburns, the suntans, the leathery skin, the hands that show hard work. These are the things that give character to people. Just like doing someone's portrait, it's, uh, it's really fun if you can get a character that almost just paints himself, so to speak. And then it's really a painstaking chore to try to do somebody that you have got to force yourself into finding something of artistic value that's of interest to you as a painter. And this is why that in many of the paintings I do, the subject matter, of course, blends itself as it has here. <clears throat> Another thing I'll show you here in terms of better hold this. Just a little easel so it won't stand up on this slick floor. This is the log home of the author James Steele from Hindman, Kentucky. And uh, the Hindman Settlement School commissioned me a couple of years ago to do this. And about eight or nine months ago, I finally got around to getting it finished. But you'll notice that <clears throat> this particular structure is probably just as it was 75 years ago. 
Jim likes it just the way it is. He has uh, the hole cut in the back door here where his cats come and go at leisure. And uh, he has his own gas well. And uh, so he can just keep the doors open and turn the gas stove up. And he said the highest gas bill he's ever had was 85 cents for a year. And that's last year. I guess prices have gone up. But uh, <clears throat> he's a most unpretentious person. and. You, you feel at home when you're there with him and just talking with him because he's not cleaning things up that company's coming. You go in, you walk around the stack of manuscripts and magazines and all of the memorabilia that he's collected over probably 70 years, been the settlement school. And it's just a, it's a rewarding experience. So in knowing Jim and getting to do this, and of course this is that's Jim in the doorway there, which uh, he's <clears throat> a fairly short person, but uh, long on words and long on writing. He's, uh, he's quite an interesting person. But I enjoyed doing the painting, and just knowing Jim gave me a little more of an insight, I think. And this thing is called Springtime on Wolf Pen, which uh, was the season that he likes best. It shows some of the dogs and red buds. And he takes a great deal of pride in keeping his yard and trees flowering with shrubs and so forth the year round as best he can. So uh, I enjoyed doing that. And it was very similar to the project I did a couple of years ago with uh, Jesse Stewart. Well, it's probably a little longer than that now. But uh, the university asked me to do something of Jesse Stewart's home which I did, and of course I don't have here, but in the ensuing process of getting that particular painting and talking with Stuart, we talked about the possibility of doing a series of paintings based on his book of poems called Kentucky is My Land. And of course the reason why we chose that particular book primarily was because I liked many of the poems that he had in there. And secondly, that was the only book of his that he had copyright returned on, which means it was old enough that the copyright had uh, come back to him. So that way we could use any of the poem, reproduce them however we felt. Uh, we need them in terms of the paintings without uh, any repercussion or getting uh, rights from publishers and etc. This particular painting here was one that he suggested that I do because it was a favorite work of his called Last Leave Home. And uh, I guess it was just prior to his end the military service in uh, the big war, WW2. But anyway, Stuart lived in this little cabin, which now I ca they call it the uh, Hilton House. I call it the McClure cabin because a good friend of mine, Kathleen McClure, lives there. And those of you from the Ashland area probably know Kathleen, but she's a delightful lady. And he suggested that I do that particular poem. So I started trying to look around and see what kind of subject matter I could dredge up that would be related to Stuart that would have some meaning in that respect. So I stumbled into Kathleen one day and she took me up to this Hilton house. And uh, I said, well, this is it. I'll just do the cabin and the snow or light in the window and some tracks leading into it or out from it, whichever the case may be. And this will be the last leave home. But it was a rewarding experience to talk with uh, Mr. Stewart in that here is, a, here is a man that is of the land, the man who made the statement that one time that he would buy every farm that his father had to shell crop on. And he did. So he ended up with something like a thousand acres in Greenup County that is now State Preserve. And I stopped in a parking lot in Olive Hill to go in the drugstore and get a Coke. I had some fountain Cokes that I used to stop and get as I would go through there. And just as I came back to the car, I was sitting there sipping on my sarsaparilla and I just looked out across this parking lot at this old brick building over at the end of the parking lot. And 
It had been a, a commercial building, and still was a commercial building, but someone, as Kentuckians are very inventive, and uh, particularly Eastern Kentuckians, in uh, finding another way to make a dollar, decided, I guess, they'd make an apartment up here in this building. So they had added on this little <coughs> porch-like thing, added some wrought iron, these long iron steps went off, against this facade of this brick building, and you could still see where the signs had been lettered on it and so forth, which had partially faded off and <clears throat> by the weathering process. And this little gray-haired lady was sitting there, and it was, I guess one of the things that, that made it important to me was that how she had worked so hard <clears throat> to create this environment of color, this very drab setting. She had worked very hard to plant and maintain all these just flowers hanging everywhere on there. Thank you. Difficult for you to see. It's the glass glaring. I make it tilt it for you if it is. I don't know. It's hard to tell what, what to do with it to get it where you can see it. But <clears throat> I just uh, took out a sketch pad and did a couple of quick sketches. And I added another figure in the doorway, which was not there. She was sitting there alone. But I had a figure there that tended to be much younger. And uh, this lady seemed to be resigned to the fact that she was going to, going to stay here. She seemed to be very much at home. And I added a figure in the door that looked outward as though you know, there must be something somewhere for me other than this little apartment and the upstairs of the hardware store or whatever might have been down underneath. So as a painter, I took a little bit of artistic license in changing the actual mood by adding that figure. And in doing so, makes it more interesting for me to work with because it added a little more of, a, of, a, of an element, a human element, that went beyond just the representational facade of painting the building and the figure that was seated there. So in taking artistic lessons many times, we do it for self-preservation, to keep from getting too bored with doing too many things that are repetitious, but it also gives you something, I think, that stimulates a little bit more for the viewer, and it makes it a little more of an interesting painting. Now, the family cemeteries, and I really summarized that very quickly and dipped through the slides very quickly simply to illustrate the points that are in the paper. However, the paper will be published, I think, in the proceedings of the conference, and I wasn't going to read it to you anyway. So uh, uh, I wanted to give you the benefit of seeing the pictorial evidence of the points that are in the paper, and that's why I brought the slides. These slides were all taken in North Central West Virginia, which is my state and ground. And, uh, but they illustrate principles that are true throughout of Appalachia. Um, the paper was retitled before I brought it down here to be uh, family cemeteries at the heart of the American attitude toward death. Now, in the paper, I suggested that there are three major and now maybe a fourth Phase, phases in the development of the American attitude toward death. The first was the Puritan attitude toward death. It was a fear of death, uh, individual salvation, priests and so on. And uh, gravestones, for instance, were engraved with gargoyle heads and death heads and this kind of thing. Very negative, very uh, pessimistic and uh, fatalistic uh, attitude toward death during the Puritan period. Then the revolutionary, oh, and at that time, however, family cemeteries were established because the Puritans needed to um, be recognized, partly because they felt they had a mission to the new world, and they had this need for recognition, so they established family and community cemeteries, some of them with uh, these gigantic headstones that marked whole families and whole communities, uh, but most with the individual headstones and footstones. I have an example of that in the Appalachian Cemetery. But um, some of them also built crypts into the sides of hills, and some of them had large burying 
areas which were marked by table stones. In other words, flat stones were laid in the ground and the inscription would be engraved there. Um, the second period, uh, the second phase of the American attitude toward death came after the Revolutionary War, split families. And then, of course, the industrial changes in the United States perpetuated that splitting of families. Um, so the Revolutionary War saw the demarcation into what is called now the Great Awakening. Why, I don't know. But anyway, it's called the Great Awakening. Some things died with it, too. But um, during that Great Awakening period, we took on a very romantic attitude toward death, and it was during this period that the cemeteries came to be revered, really revered, and even depended upon. Uh, death was viewed to be a transition into a reunion with those who had gone before or those who were separated from the family and so on. So that engravings on the tombstones, for instance, changed from these death heads and gargoyles to cherubs and weeping willows and urns and clasped hands, the uh, reunion uh, symbolized by the clasped hands and so on. Interestingly enough, very few Christian symbols were used during this period, although this was a very strongly religious period as a Puritan. Christian symbols were not used on the tombstones for fear of idolatry. So it isn't only, it's only more, much more recent times that we find Christian symbols on gravestones. Anyway, the Great Awakening, the period of the Great Awakening is the period of the establishment of what we know as the family cemetery. And it is the period of the development in the metropolitan areas and urban areas of what was called rural cemeteries. Now these were in metropolitan areas, but they were called rural cemeteries because they imitated the country cemeteries. These came about for two reasons. One is that the family members who had gone to the cities were not able to be transported back home for burial. In fact, quite often, no one back home even knew that the person had died until much later. When that happened, the graveyard in the city uh, became little more than a quagmire, badly neglected because there was nobody there to take care of it. And it was overrun by as the city developed. So that uh, the situation of in the cemeteries at the beginning of the Great Awakening and before the development of the whole cemeteries in the cities was really bad. So the cities like Boston and New Haven, where the two best known rural cemeteries were established, one in 1796, the one in New Haven was the first, and dedicated <coughs> in 1796. Um, Mount Auburn in uh, Boston, dedicated in 831. These big sections of land were bought up by the cities or by rich families who then sold plots to individuals or to families who had moved into the city area. Um, it got to the point where people were putting a lot of into the rural cemeteries in the cities, building elaborate gravestones and plots and so on and so on. Um, now, the third period, the third phase of the American attitude toward death is the one that we're experiencing throughout most of the country now. That's a denial of death. To the point that, um, and I, maybe I'll read that part of the page to really a very interesting uh, description of that. Um, third and fourth attitudes. Right now, we're going into what the sociologists are claiming as what looks to be the fourth attitude toward death, the fourth, fourth phase of the American attitude toward death, going back to the attitude of the Great Awakening. You're going to hear about old Edgar Baptist first here, and, and start. I'm going to be dealing with old Edgar Baptist in a sense of place, uh, dealing specifically with their phenomenon of coming back every summer, those who have traveled out of the area to uh, say up in the upper Midwest or even down to Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, and a number of areas where they have migrated to, coming back for their annual conventions or sessions in their association meetings. But I'm going to first kind of introduce you to the old regulars themselves. Most people do not know anything about old regulars unless they have seen the um, film in the good old-fashioned way, and that would probably be their only introduction to them. There are about 15,000 old regular Baptists 
official Old Regular Baptists, meaning that they are members of Old Regular Fellowships, and they're scattered primarily in about 12 counties, eastern Kentucky, and in three counties of southwestern Virginia, Buchanan, Dickinson, and in Wise County. There are a few that spread a little bit east of there into Russell County and into Washington County and even into uh, Grayson County, Virginia. But for the most part, we're talking about a sect of Baptists that are right along the border of uh, Tennessee, or excuse me, of Virginia and Kentucky, and then spring up a little bit into uh, West Virginia and somewhat into Ohio. Uh, in addition to the 15,000 or so actual members of Old Regular Baptists, there would be a, another, a, an equal number or perhaps a little bit large number that are regular attendees at uh, Old Regular Services and, and therefore would, would have to be counted among the flock. So we're dealing with maybe 30, 35,000 people, not an awfully large number, but in uh, Eastern Kentucky, a fairly significant cultural force. A little bit about them just as uh, people, as worshipers, and some of their doctrines before I start dealing with the uh, actual annual summer sessions that they, they have. Uh, they're just about the, with the possible exception of some of the primitive Baptists in the area, they're just about the most old time way uh, subdenominations in the region. They hold doggedly to a number of very, very rigid biblical, primarily Pauline codes relative to behavior and to worship. This includes not allowing their women to cut their hair for the most part. Some of the associations are a little bit more liberal on that than others, but old regular women will, uh, their hair will perhaps fall way down into the middle of the back and below. Uh, most of the, <coughs> the older, old regular women will wear their hair up in various forms of top notches, but then the younger ones sometimes will allow it to fall very uh, way down. And, I, and uh, this last February, I was at uh, Stone Cold Church, and I saw a woman, uh, a relatively young woman in her about a mid-30s or something, just absolutely beautiful hair that fell right down to a hemline. They are, this has been a cause for uh, being dismissed from the fellowship, I mean, you know, women cutting their hair. Uh, in contrast to this, though, the men must cut their hair, cut their hair very, very regularly. They can wear beards, and some of them occasionally. There are a few that look almost Amish with their uh, full beards, but that's not a, uh, I wouldn't want to put that forth as a, a general image of what the old regular men look like. They are, a very much a male-dominated type of religious group. Uh, they follow Paul explicitly when Paul says, let your women be silent, keep silence in church. Women are not allowed to be involved in any form of church governance. They do not vote. Uh, they do not participate actively in any type of, of leadership in the church service itself. Uh, they cannot lead in prayers. They cannot lead singing. They obviously cannot uh, preach and they cannot hold any form of church office. That does not mean, though, that the old regular women are not involved in a very forceful way in church worship. They are. In fact, if you go to an old regular service, you will frequently get the feeling that it is the women really setting the sort of emotional um, tempo of the church, etc. They are hollering church, and I, I would suggest to you that there's probably nothing that um, that sort of does things to your spine more than to hear several old regular matrons begin their hollering. It is a, it is a real experience. And, they, and their hollering sometimes gets kind of orchestrated with the preaching and in a very rhythmical way. Uh, the preaching itself is, is, is not typical, exactly typical, chanted preaching. Some of you have heard much of the, the sort of rhythmical chanting, almost sung preaching of uh, the uh, Eastern Kentucky preacher. And this is 
prevalent not only in old regularism but in the United I mean, uh, Baptist and also in Primitive Baptist. Uh, what, but their particular style takes on a, an, an interesting little flourish in the sense that they a wail that they go into. The old regular men are, the preacher's always leading into this. This tends to be the, the emotional peak of, of, a, of any particular segment of the sermon, and you can see them sort of leading into this body-wise and everything until the point that they will, and they will tend to put their hand up to their ear like this because they can hear their voice better that way, and, they're off, and, they, and they start bobbing forward a little bit, and then they get into this rhythmical pattern, and then after, after a minute, they will just go way, way down in a very sort of deep genuflect, and then, and at that point, generally letting their voice sail upward in a, in a wailing sound. And some of them have a, a very beautiful thing that they do after that point, because then they kind of allow their voices to cascade downwards with uh, lower whale, wails as they, they go downward. Uh, singing in regular church is done exclusively by the old blind method. They do not allow any type of, of musical instrument in the church and do not allow song, uh, at least song books with musical notation in them. They do have song books. Uh, a lot of individual churches, for, uh, in fact, published song books for their particular uh, flock and then uh, sometimes at association meetings, they will make money for, say, repainting of the church or buying an air conditioner for the church or something by selling their particular songbook. And it will just be a gathering of the old songs designed that they are fond of singing in their own particular church. But the line method is the same method that began uh, in England in the 1600s and, and uh, then sort of came to the United States during the colonial period, but the elder uh, stands before the congregation, um, lines out the song one couplet of it. He does it in a very quick chanting fashion, and then the uh, uh, congregation picks up these lines and elongates them, and their uh, singing is very, very stretched out, and again, uh, a kind of a wailing type of pattern, which has a mournful effect to it, and uh, when I first started working with the old regulars back in, in uh, 82, 1982, I, I, uh, I, it wasn't pe appealing to my ear at all. I've, I've told some of the people that I'm close to it and everything, and I don't know what's happening to, it, to me, but I'm beginning to like some of these sounds I'm hearing and uh, may go into some sort of culturalization process in some way. Um, doctrine. They are separated from the primitive doctrine-wise uh, concerning the doctrine of atonement. Many of you know that the primitives tend to be staunchly Calvinistic in this regard and believe in the doctrine of, el of the elect, particular election, meaning some of the, the more um, staunchly Calvinistic primitives believe the, the concept that there was a particular body of people that were determined be, literally before the beginning of time that ultimately they were then were going to become beneficiaries of the atonement. In other words, they were, these numbers were known before the very, before Adam's fall and then uh, afterwards all we did was just kind of plug into the process because these were the elect. Uh, the old regulars do not believe this. They do have a general atonement doctrine, which means that they at least say that uh, Christ's death was for all mankind. Uh, however, where they limit their concept of the atonement is that they are very non-evangelistic. They believe that God calls not man, and how that uh, translates into behavioral uh, or you know, preaching type of, of behavior is that they believe that the preacher is not up there exhorting anyone to conversion. Uh, they, they reject that concept altogether. Um, I, I am not up there, the elder would say, uh, attempting to get you to convert to Christianity or something. That's not my role. I am I'm preaching the joy, 
he would say, of redemption. You may listen in, you may learn from that, uh, how that translates into your own life. Uh, it may make you a better person, but ultimately it has no effect upon your call because your call must, they say, come from God. It's not going to come early. They, are, they have the uh, strong sort of Anabaptist tradition in them in that regard. They uh, very seldom will go down to the water uh, before about their mid-20s. Uh, contrary to, say, the missionary Baptists, where the, the children are being baptized down uh, very early in the age of accountability, somewhere down around 12, maybe 13, or even earlier than that, I've seen missionary Baptist children of eight or nine being baptized. The old regulars would frown upon this and say, uh, there's a way in the world that those youngsters could uh, recognize a call at that point and uh, they're going to have to have some maturity on them before they recognize a call, which means that they're usually going to get up into their <laughs> mid-twenties as a sort of a minimum before they receive this call. In actual practice, however, and you can see this when you read the, the uh, mints uh, of the various associations and read the obituaries that they have in the back of the minute, that these people will go through the, their baptisms of being called sometimes up in their 50s and even 60s. Now, actual baptism, actual church membership, however, is not necessarily the, the requisite to being redeemed. Uh, I'm, I am carefully using this term redeemed rather than saved because their, their concept saved implies a sort of a man's action in the process, whereas redeemed implies a God's action in the process, and that is all. But uh, if, if you look, well, back to this point of you don't have to have church membership working for you or you don't have to have been baptized. Um, they believe that uh, it is entirely possible that you would have received your call and accepted your call without any sort of formal process following that of church membership or baptism. Those are signs uh, that... Uh, uh, of something having happened to you if they fully recognize that indeed you may go through a bab baptism and, and may not have received a call. In fact, they firmly believe in the concept of once called, once truly redeemed, you do not fall away, never can fall away. If indeed you have joined the church, you have been baptized in, in the past, and then ultimately do appear to have fallen away, succumb to drunkenness and behavior or something, divorce your wife or anything of that sort, to him that's just a, a clear indication that you were not truly called to begin with, that there was an error in the process, you had misinterpreted to something, or you were yourself devious in, in claiming the call when it was not there. Associations. There are 16, perhaps 17 associations of old regular Baptists in the area that I've been uh, talking about. I say perhaps 17 because there's one association, the either pronounced Kiova or Calva Association up in West Virginia that I have not made contact with. I have been told, though, that this association still does exist. Now, the 16 or 17 count is my count. If you ask old regulars, they, most of the associations or members of an individual fellowship would not claim that many because there are some associations that other associations do not recognize as being any more legitimate old regulars. This, for instance, is true of the Friendship Association. There are two Friendship Associations, one's up in uh, Buchanan County and then lapping over into West Virginia. The other one is solely in West Virginia. Uh, the old Friendship Association claims that the Friendship Association has fallen away from the true doctrine and are no longer old regulars. In fact, I wouldn't even call them old regulars because some of their preachers have gone on the, on the rail. Some of them have, have uh, sort of brought in the, the kind of rinky-dink uh, uh, Nashville Southern Gospel sound into their singing, etc., and so they don't appear to be old regulars. There's a small association down in Wise County called the Cumberland Association, only three churches. I've included in my number, but I would not, I, most of the old regs would not call them old regular anymore. In fact, this summer they may indeed have fallen into total uh, disunity and, and apparently are not even meeting in, a, in association meetings. 
association meetings once a year, uh, late summer, early fall. They usually begin somewhere around about the first weekend in August, and then they will go into the last weekend in September. This is their annual business meeting of all churches in the association. A couple of associations are quite large. Union Association has 70 churches, uh, but not still, it, these, these churches are fairly small, so that, you know, it's, the total number is still not all that large. They have just a little over 3,000 total membership in the Union Association scattered among those 72 churches. By the way, two of those 72 churches are down in Florida. There are a couple of them up in Michigan, one in Indiana, a couple in Ohio, and that sort of thing. They've kind of spread out as the migration out of the area has taken old regulars into various positions, and that's really what I'm going to key into in just a second here. Um, they, um, they, when they meet this to conduct the annual business of the association, it is also a rather massive worship service, and it is also a social gathering. It's a three-day affair. Um, let me deal with the Union Association as an example, and then maybe slide in the New Salem Association also as, as an example. Uh, Union Association meets at the fairground in, in Wise, Virginia. Um, on good weekends, meaning if it's not raining and that sort of thing, they will gather in uh, probably about 3,000 there on the fairground. Now, keep in mind, there are only 1,000 in, in the association. That doesn't mean that they bring in every member from every church in there. The old regulars are fond of going to each other's association meetings, particularly those um, associations that correspond with each other, recognize each other's legitimacy. And so they, they go from one association meeting to the other, and it's not unusual for one individual to go to four or five association meetings. This, this summer I was at five association meetings and I'm sure that at, at one time or another I saw a, a person that I, you know, all five times uh, would see them uh, at those association meetings because these are, these are big things and there are a lot of, um, there's the spiritual element to it, they, they get very much involved in the emotional services and everything. They're also keenly interested in the business that's going on, and they, uh, they, they want to hear the debates, and some of these debates are doctrinal debates and, and other things. And then, of course, there's the social element, the, the meeting with people that they haven't seen for perhaps a year or more uh, from other associations, particularly if this is people com from coming up, uh, up in the Ohio area, Michigan area, or Indiana and coming back to the area or somebody who has moved uh, down to, to Florida, et cetera. Uh, Union Association has a large tent that they put up on the fairground. It's, uh, it'll, it'll hold about eight to nine hundred people depending upon how you set up the chair, chairs. And uh, they sit also in the, underneath the tent, what they call the stand which is the, the riser where all the preaching and, and business meeting is being carried on from. And all the, uh, uh, the dignitaries, the power structure of the association, of course, sit up there. Then in addition to this, they, there is in the fairground there an, uh, an arena, a covered arena that's used at regular fair sessions as a kind of an outdoor concert area. Well, that's where they have just the regular preaching and singing. In the 86 session of the association, one of the churches, um, I wrote about this in the, in the summer, there's an article in the last the summer issue of the Appalachian Journal on it, but anyway, um, one of the uh, elders in one of the churches accused another elder of adultery. Uh, the assistant moderator was the one accusing the moderator of adultery, so it was the moderator. Now, obviously, if it, for that type of a charge, this moderator was going to be going out and that sort of thing, but the church had said over this. In the first day of the, of the session, when um, the churches were presenting their letters, this particular church <laughs> showed up with two letters, indicating that there were two groups now uh, attempting to be recognized as the official, official church. 
Well, this wouldn't work, of course, and uh, so the issue was put aside until the, the next day when it could be de debated. I sat under that tent, 800 people in that tent, and listened to what essentially was a, a adultery trial for a while until it got shoved into a committee, and then the committee did the rest of the, the work on it. They follow, again, Paul's admonition. Don't take, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but don't take your disputes outside the fellowship into the civil courts. Argue them in the fellowship. They, they strongly believe that no fellowship members should ever sue another fellowship member, for example. That issue, whatever it should be, should be resolved within the fellowship. And so in business meetings of old regulars, you're apt to hear something really very, very colorful and very, as I say, exciting and, and a lot of heat. There was crying going on in the tent. There was some anger. Uh, John Lane, the moderator of the association, was having a great deal of trouble uh, controlling some of the heat and the passion there, but he did so. And one of the things that has impressed me with old regulars in their meeting, they have a very, very tight sense uh, set of rules of decorum. And they vary a little bit from Robert's rules of order and everything, but they follow. And they and uh, I'm I'm amazed that the, I, you know, I've said in in faculty meetings at Appalachian State University and heard a heck of a lot more misbehaving than I've heard sometimes in uh, old regular business meetings. So I'm impressed with the fact that they they do control this to a, a large degree. Now. Uh, these annual sessions and a sense of, of, of place. Obviously, people are coming back to the region uh, every summer, and sometimes literally every summer. I interviewed a, a lady at the New Salem uh, Association meeting last year. Uh, they meet every year in Floyd County in a little town of Minnie, and she had uh, I believe the number was, it was 34, 36. Uh, I've got that in that uh, Appalachian uh, Journal article. But anyway, the consecutive association meetings, and I speculated in that, that article that there could be some who probably had attended a lot more than that, maybe even as many as 50. But there's a great dedication to coming back to this. I kind of wanted to get a, a feeling for this uh, in terms of one family as to what, what this meant. There is one old regular Baptist church in the state of North Carolina, one. And it is not anywhere close to the mountains. It is in Brunswick County. Brunswick County is the last coastal county before it fall off the map of North Carolina and down into, into South Carolina. It is a little town of Winnebo. And Winnebo is on Highway 17. It runs down from Wilmington down towards the Myrtle Beach area and then from there clear on down to Florida. Um, I had long wanted to, to search out this church to see what an old regular church in Brunswick County, North Carolina would look like and, and see what it had changed and everything. Well, I, I had a, an opportunity to do so. I was vacationing this this past summer at Holden Beach. And uh, Holden is in Brunswick County, and I uh, looked at the map, and there was, was Winnebo only about 15 miles away from me. And so I said, I'm going to search out the New Hope Church in Winnebo, North Carolina. Well, I drove up to Winnebo one morning. I, I didn't know where this church would be. And folks, if you ever tried to find an old regular church when you don't know where it is, that's a chore because they don't have signs out on the front. They don't have these marquees. They don't have flashing lights or anything. And in fact, they almost defy you to find them. Even when I listen to people tell me how to get there, those any of you who have worked with, with uh, Appalachian folks realize that they give directions not by road, uh, road numbers and everything, but by hollows and ridges and that sort of thing, and then they would give me direction and always end up with the sort of uh, mandatory, you can't miss it, they were attached on to the end of the thing. Well, I frequently could miss it. Well, anyway, I drove up to Winnow, 
and uh, and drove into what appeared to be the little town of Winnebo, and, and um, I thought, well, I'll drive around, I'll discover this church, and I stopped, and I talked to three or four people, you know anything about an old regular Baptist church? Well, I know there's a free will over here, there's a missionary over here, there's some sort of Baptist over here, and that sort of thing, but no one seemed to know anything about a, an old regular Baptist. Well, it just ha so happened that I saw two, two gentlemen out cutting the lawn of uh, this one church, and I stopped to ask them. Well, the older of the two said, sure, you need to talk to this fellow over here. Well, uh, the, young, the, the fellow was a young man in his, in his 20s, and his name was Claude Coffey. And uh, Claude indeed was a member of the New Hope Church and was so tickled to death that I was looking for an old regular Baptist in Brunswick County that he that he jumped in his car and he led me right to the church and then ultimately led me to Sister Rena Caldwell. Emmett and Rena Caldwell were from Letcher County. Uh, Emmett had worked in the mines in Letcher and Harlan in, in Perry County from 1936 up to 1950. And he developed a very, very bad case of black lung. He had to retire from mining, and he tried farming a little bit, but he just couldn't seem to make that. He had three sons, but the oldest was only 16. Uh, Rena, his wife, was working in a, in a small factory, he needed more help to make a, the farm work and everything. And besides, he was really getting worried about his three sons. He told his wife, Rena, and he said, I'm, I'm just simply not going to tolerate them growing up and working in the mines, and if we stay here, I'm not sure I can guarantee that that will be the case. The two of them then started speculating as to what they might do. Rena had some family down in Brunswick County, including a brother. They had moved down there several, several years before and were into farming. Let's go over there into North Carolina, look the situation over and see if we can't move. 1953, that's what they did. So they ended up in, in Brunswick County. Well, um, Sister Ina had been a Maggard before her marriage. She was the granddaughter of Francis Maggard, one of the patriarchs of the, of the old regular Baptist church, particularly important in the history of the uh, Indian Bottom Association and the uh, Thornton Union Association. She was obviously tied in with the whole culture of uh, old regularism. She got over there, and she, she said, well, I, there were a bunch of Baptist churches around the area, and I started uh, visiting them, and she said she, there, there was a free will there, and she visited the free will, and she didn't see anything like old regularism. It was just, and she visited uh, a missionary Baptist, uh, shocked, absolutely shocked by the singing uh, and all that type of thing. And then she visited one that she just called a, just a, an ordinary Baptist. I assume to have been just a Southern Baptist church. But she was disturbed that she wasn't going to be able to practice her religion. They, stood, they, they had four people in the area, including uh, Sister Rena and some of her, um, her side of the family that were already members of the old regular Baptist. They started transferring their memberships one one old regular Baptist church so that they then eventually arm off. Uh, they got all of their memberships transferred to the Bethany Baptist Church and, um, and I'm gonna, you're our next speaker, aren't you? And I'm gonna have to stop here now. Uh, in uh, Kingsport. And then were able to arm off finally in uh, 1972 and form the uh, New Hope Church there. Every summer, Sister Rena comes back, and she has, for all the time he has been there in Brunswick County, back to the associate meetings. I sat with her this summer under the tent there at, at the Union Association meeting and got her just to kind of reminisce on what she got out of it. And um, frankly, I couldn't imagine a, a tighter uh, sort of connection with, indeed, a sense of place in uh, Central Appalachia. 
I'll stop there. I don't know if I should entertain questions at this point, whether I should let uh, Mr. Cox go on here. I think maybe I'd better let you go on and I'll, if there are any questions later, I'll ask. I'm, I'll introduce myself. I'm Gary Cox, from a professor of geography here at Morris State University. I've chosen to call this brief uh, presentation, Topelia and Technological Change in Appalachia. Excuse me. The following question <coughs> applies in a general sense to rural Appalachia, but specifically uh, to the upper Big Sandy Basin. It's an essay expressing a viewpoint rather than a, a report on a specific research project. It's based on the experience of growing up in a cove in the mountains of southwestern Virginia, on two decades of, of impressions from teaching Appalachian youth, and some of them are not youth. Uh, it's based on many years of research, study, and observation as I've attempted to prepare and teach a course on Appalachia. Many of you are no doubt puzzled a bit by the term topophilia. In fact, I've heard people ask me the last few days, are you going to talk about landforms? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, but you may be puzzled about the term topophilia, and you may be wondering how this fits into an overall, to the overall theme of this program, a sense of place. We owe a fine Chinese-American geographer, a fellow named Yifu Tuan, at the University of Minnesota, credit for articulating the concept of topophilia. In his words, topophilia is the, uh, the, the affective bond between people and place. It literally translates as love of place, but it's much more than that. Uh, topelia is intensely personal. It involves one's feelings about his environment, but it is concerned with more than just an understanding of the conditions of the local environment. It is, in, it is influenced by presentations, by perceptions, past linkages, and the hopes and dreams of the future. It is the key essence it's its very essence, in fact, the key bit, I guess, of what we call sense of place. And it's a good term. Topophy is also influenced by many factors that are subject to change, uh, to change through time. The most important are related to means of livelihood, to technological change. Topophy is, is most apparent in populations that are somewhat restricted or, or somewhat uh, limited in size of territory. Uh, it has been attributed to the people of England, this Emerald Isle or this, uh, this beautiful island. Uh, you, you see it among people of valleys and, and fairly circumscribed environments. Uh, you rarely see it applying to a great empire like the United States. The Appalachian Highlander ties to, uh, the Appalachian Highlander's ties to the material environment the land in which he lives, are more than just aesthetic or, or tactile. It's a permanent and enduring connection that would have great, uh, that the mountaineer or the highlander would have uh, great difficulty in verbalizing. The beautiful, rugged, but often austere land is or was his home. The land that nurtured him, the land that provided his livelihood, however meager that might have been the locus of his memories, the place he reared his children, the final resting place of generations of his ancestors, and the place where he would in turn be returned to the earth. Most observers of Appalachia's people would agree that individually and collectively they seem to possess a strong sense of, of place, identity with place, a characteristic that seems to have been largely lost by a lot of people of America. Lifestyle, economic situation, cultural background, stage of life, means of livelihood, age, level of education, all these combine to form our sense of place or the intensity of our personal topophilia. Technological change in rural Appalachia has had an impact on, Appal on the Appalachian sense of place. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Cultural shaking, literally culture shaking uh, changes have occurred in transportation, in communication and in the economy of Central Appalachia, especially since 1940. As a result uh, of these changes, a new generation of Appalachians have grown up um, 
we could say two generations have almost run up now, uh, that are quite different in outlook from their parents and their grandparents before them. I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm going back this second. The modern, um, the modern Appalachian, the modern Highlanders' contact with uh, the natural environment is less direct. It's it's uh, less personal than that of generations. Very few today depend on a precarious agriculture for a livelihood. Fewer still are professional woodsmen. Before 1940, agriculture was the most important activity in most of the Appalachian Highlands. Most families outside the scattered towns and coal camps were dependent on farming uh, or dependent on at least subsistence farming for all or part of their subsistence. Few occupations can match a farmer's closeness to the land. His life was tied to the, to the vagaries of the physical environment. It's widely assumed that that his close, this, this closeness to the land created a, a bond between a man and his land. Actually, very little of, of substance is known about uh, the attitude of a Highlander, of, of a Highland farmer to his land. It's uh, been the subject of considerable romanticizing, uh, speculation, but almost no substantive research has been devoted to that topic. For uh, centuries, a body of romantic literature has accumulated on the advantages and the pleasure of rural life. Uh, it started in Europe and it's continued here. All, all of it is romantic nonsense, written by people who's, who never try to uh, rest an uncertain living from a very difficult land. Uh, someone once remarked that uh, much of what's written is written by uncalloused hands. However, there is little doubt that a strong affective bond existed between the Appalachian farmer and his environment. The essence of this bond was articulated by a, a farmer interviewed by Robert Coles a few years ago. Uh, to me, the land I have is always there. It's, it's a part of me, way inside me. It's as much me as my own arms and legs. For the Highland farmer, life was, was hard and uh, offered few amenities. In the more rugged counties of the Cumberland Plateau, bottomland was extremely limited. Many farmers had no little land at all, only steep, heavily wooded, oftentimes rocky hillsides. Their only tools were simple and crude, the mattock, grubbing hole, goose-necked hole, an axe, a fro, a cross-cut saw, and a bull tongue plow. Families were large. Eight or ten children were not unusual at all. A modern observer might wonder in amazement that a, a large family could, could be fed and clothed on a few acres in such an austere environment. But survive they did. Farming was uh, supplemented by hunting, trapping, uh, herb digging and other forms of gathering. Survival demanded not only a, a lot of hard work, but an intimate knowledge of the environment that uh, the Highland farmer was so much a part of. And no doubt has, con has contributed to a stream of out-migration from Appalachia that has ebbed and flowed the last century. However, most Highland farmers apparently had a reassuring sense of their, of their place in the world. They knew where they were they knew where they fitted. Rufus Reed, uh, now deceased, uh, a Martin County man, he did some writing a few years ago, uh, summed up the feelings very well. And Rufus Reed was, was one of them. He had uh, grown up on scabby little hill farms. And Rufus Reed said, I never heard my, I never heard many complaints from any of the men on Keeney. Neither did they fuss or fume over their land or over their hard lot. Nor did, they offer, did, 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 or nor did they often vow to leave these dark, forbidding hills. The hard life presented them with a challenge, and they met it head on. At the beginning of the 20th century, 
the machine age began to alter Appalachia. The production of large-scale coal mining added a new aspect to the region. During the first three decades of this century, a spectacular coal boom spread through the coal-rich plateaus of central Appalachia. Uh, I'm saying a 30-year boom here. It was kind of a, it ebbed and flowed. It wasn't all boom. But an, an almost insatiable demand for railroad workers, prop cutters, and miners create tens of, or, or it created jobs and it, it actually concentrated tens of thousands of people into teeming ribbons of settlement along the creeks and hollows. The arrival of, of railroads, the construction of mining camps and service centers, and the explosive growth of industrial employment shattered traditional patterns of livelihood and behavior. Few residents of the plateau were left uh, untouched. However, many of the residents of the creeks and hollows continued to practice the, the semi-subsistence agriculture of their ancestors. Most, uh, most families, up until at least World War II, kept a, a few head of livestock. They kept a milk cow, kept some hogs, they kept a flock of chickens, and they produced enough um, they produced enough uh, corn and, uh, and other crops to feed that livestock and to provide most of their own food. And even many in the mining camps managed to find places for gardens up on the hillsides or, or, or the likes. There was still that close bond, that close attachment to agriculture. After 1940, a new wave of technological change began to significantly alter the bond between the mountaineer of Appalachia and the rugged homeland in which he was trying to live. The mechanization of agriculture outside the highlands uh, was probably a key event. The mechanization of Midwestern agriculture, uh, the mecha mechanization of agriculture outside the highlands, quickly made Appalachian agriculture redundant. Before the coming of the machine age to American agriculture, a man with a plow could plow a moderate slope easier than you could plow a flat place. And uh, as long as that, as long as we were at that level of technology. Uh, the Appalachian wasn't that much worse off than anybody else. But he couldn't automate his farms. And they were too small, they were too mountainous. And the efficient of Midwestern large-scale farming, along with uh, the ready availability of cheap welfare food, I hate to say that, but it's true, and improved uh, transportation, made the labor intensive. These things combined to make the labor intensive agricultural practices of semi-subsistence farming a hopeless enterprise. And in the four decades since World War II, agriculture has all disappeared from more rugged areas such as the Upper Big Sandy or the, or the Kentucky River Basin. Agricultural abandonment has been especially rapid since 1960. For example, in the Leviza Fork Basin, uh, the, the Liza, Leviza Fork is the right branch of the Big Sandy over here. And in the Leviza Fork Basin, almost 58% of the farms appeared between 1964 and 1969. Most of what little remained have disappeared since then. Between 1969 and 1970, the number of farms declined by another 38.6%. And the 19, in the 1974 census, uh, 1974 census of agriculture enumerated 3,000 268 farms, I think, in an area that occupies, that's occupied by 345,000 people. You can see how little, what a small role it's playing as far as subsistence goes. And um, the most recent uh, agricultural census indicates that this trend may have, uh, may be ending, that this decline in the number of farms. But only 5% only 5% of the land that was used for crop production in 1940 was still in production in 1974. That says a lot. Most of that minuscule uh, acreage has been abandoned since then, or been alienated to other uses. And in a land, uh, in a land use study for the Corps of Engineers in 1980, uh, I could find uh, very little evidence of either commercial or semi-subsistence agriculture in a drainage basin covering almost, almost a million and a half acres. Uh, I conducted this in several ways. I, and during that um, 
period when we were looking at that, I drove every paved road in the Levisa Fork Basin from West County, Virginia to the forks of over here at Louisa. I, I had the Corps of Engineers do up-to-date aerial photography, and I poured over those photographs for months uh, with a stereoscopic mirror, and you don't miss much uh, with a magnifying glass and, and an aerial photograph. And to me, agriculture in the Big Sandy in 1980 was conspicuous by its absence. Obviously, in some parts of Appalachia, agriculture is, is no longer a significant part of the physical bond between a highlander and his land. And if we're saying that topophilia is most associated with agriculture, then Appalachians wouldn't have much of it. Modern transportation makes it possible today for most of Appalachia's population, I'll get through in a couple minutes, uh, modern transportation makes it possible for most of Appalachia's population to easily commute to peripheral cities for uh, shopping, for entertainment, health care, education, even employment. Today, the, the residents of the remotest hollow or creek watch the same television programs, they listen to the same music, and they read the same newspapers and magazines as other Americans. A new generation of Appalachians has grown up with no direct ties to the land. Uh, that th at least no direct ties in terms of agriculture or in terms of a livelihood from the forest or something like that that had their ancestors. The difference is uh, that distinguish Appalachians today, young Appalachians today, from other Kentuckians or from other Americans are little more than nuances. They're quite simply Americans, no more and no less. Uh, Thomas R. Ford I noticed uh, several years ago that Appalachians have adopted the goals and standards of American society. Now, I'm not saying that there is nothing left in this bond. The major point I've tried to make is that topophilia, this feeling for our land, is still alive in Appalachia. But technological change has uh, considerably diminished it. it it's, uh, it's, it, if the basis of the almost legendary sense of place that has been long attributed to us as a people was a close relationship to the land, then topophilia may be an endangered species. The passing of topophilia would leave Appalachia a greatly, a greatly diminished place. Any comments, statements?